Hi everyone, my name is Bishi. I'm one of the health insurance navigator with the legal assistance of Western New York. Now, as a reminder, I would just want us to know that um, legal assistance of Western New York, known as LAWNI, is a nonprofit law firm providing free legal services in civil matters to qualified residents of New York State. And the Navigators Program assist individuals and families with understanding and enrolling in health plans through the New York State of Health. Now, the New York State of Health have the um, 2022 open enrollment going on right now. And I would just want to give us an insight into what that means. Um, the open enrollment period as um, in, um, defined here is a limited period in the year for enrollment into qualified health plan. It usually runs from the, ele I mean, the 16th of November of the current year and goes on to the 31st of January of the next year. That is subject to extension by the Department of Health. Now there are exceptions to the open enrollment period that we can find under special enrollment period. Um, we'll be talking more about that when we discuss um, information on the qualified health plan um, on another presentation. So in other words, what I want us to understand is that the open enrollment period only relates to qualified health plans. It does not apply to programs like Medicaid, Essential Plan, or Child Health Plus. So that means one can enroll in Medicaid, Essential Plan, and Child Health Plus at any time of the year. And then, I want us to also be reminded that the, the New York State of Health Marketplace was set up to provide subsidized health insurance coverage to residents of New York State. To be eligible for coverage through the New York State of Health Marketplace, you must be a resident of New York State. You must be a citizen or have satisfactory immigration status, and you must be under the age of 65. There are some exceptions to that, however. To apply, you can apply through the marketplace in one of three ways. It can be in person with an assistor like myself. You can also apply online through the New York State of Health website, www.nystateofhealth.ny.gov. The third option is to apply via the telephone. You can call the marketplace at 1-855-355-5777. You can also call one of the assistors, like myself. We also can assist you with the application over the phone. Now we have basically four different programs under the financial application with the marketplace. Um, and these are Medicaid, Child Health Loss, Essential Plan, and the Advanced Premium Tax Credit with or without cost sharing reduction. Um, today, we are talking basically about Medicaid, which I believe is the most popular of the programs offered by the New York State of Health. Um, I try to define what Medicaid means, and I find that it's a public insurance program that provides health coverage to low-income families and individuals, including children, parents, pregnant women, seniors, and people with disabilities. It is funded jointly by the federal government and the states. To be eligible for Medicaid, the major determinant would be your immigration status. Um, um, it would be seen that you must be a US citizen to qualify for Medicaid. But in the course of my experience, I've seen people that are not US citizen qualifying for Medicaid based on other information, or sorry, other information entered into the application. So I would say you would not be able to really determine if you're eligible for Medicaid until you complete the entire application. But the major determinant of whether you will qualify would be your immigration status, your family size, and your income. Now, when we talk about income, 
for um, eligibility determination, I would want us to know that um, the New York State of Health use your adjusted gross income. Many of us make the mistake of reporting our net income, stating that, well, if I put my adjusted gross, that is not how much I earn, I don't go home with that. But the system wants you to report your adjusted gross income. And you do not have to report your assets, resources, income from, from child support, your workers' compensation, veterans' payments, gifts, inheritances, and, and so on. Now, there are other criteria used for the eligibility determination. Like I said earlier, you would not be able to, you know, be assertive or be very sure of your eligibility for Medicaid until you put your information into the application. There are different criteria for Medicaid eligibility for different category of people. So to be sure that we are given the correct information on your eligibility, I would advise that you complete an application. However, what I have mentioned so far goes a long way to determine if you qualify for Medicaid. And then we come to the income chart. This would help us understand how your income and family size is being applied to your eligibility determination for Medicaid. Be Looking at this chart, sorry. This is Yolanda. Can you, don't forget to share your screen. I'm sharing. You can see it? No, we can't see it yet. Oh, let me go back. Sorry about that one moment. Thank you. Can you see it? No, not yet. Not yet. If you're having difficulties, then proceed without it. But I just wanted to just let you know we, we can't see it. But thank you. One moment. Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Good, sorry about that. I thought you have seen it all along. So um, I've talked about um, Law New York. I've um, also talked about open enrollment as it applies to qualified health plan only. It doesn't apply to Medicaid, Child Health Plus and Essential Plan. You can enroll in those programs at any time during the year. And that is information about New York State of Health official marketplace with their eligibility criteria and how to apply for coverage through the marketplace. And then the type of financial programs the New York State of Health offers, Medicaid Child Health Plus Essential Plan and the Advanced Premium Task Credit with or without the cost sharing reduction. And then I came to Medicaid. I've been able to provide my own definition of Medicaid. And I talked about the eligibility determination, the income being the adjusted gross income and not your net. You do not have to report your assets, resources, income from child support, workers' compensation, gift or inheritances, and a couple of other more income information you do not have to provide. On income information, knowing the right income to report, I usually advise that you contact a tax professional to determine if a particular income needs to be reported when you file your taxes. If you do not have to report a particular income on your tax return, then we do not need it on your New York State of Health application only your taxable income needs to be reported. And it has to be the adjusted gross. That is your income before any tax is taken out. Um, it works better for me when I deal with people that earn hourly income, like someone earning $15 and working 40 hours a week. We just put in $15, $15 an hour, 40 hours a week, and the system would help you to calculate how much that will be for the entire year. 
And um, some people start working in the middle of the year or change jobs um, um, in the middle of a year. For those type of people, there is the option to report your income as accurate as possible by not choosing the option to report part-time or full-time job. You would have to report your income under past employment so that the system would give you the option to report your start and end date of a particular job, the amount of income for that job, and then you go to the next slide, report your start date and end date for the second job. If you're on a current job and you think, well, I might not be on this job for more than two months, based on the fact that you are on the job at the time of your application, the system would require that you report that income up to the end of the year. And then when you stop to earn that income, you come back on your application and report a new income stating, I no longer earn this particular income, okay? And then I am on the income chart to make us understand how your income and family size is being applied to your Medicaid eligibility. I would use the example of a household of one. Now we can see that parents or caretaker or single childless couple, adult age 19 to 20, living with parents, would qualify for Medicaid from $0 up till $17,775 annual income. That would put that um, particular household at 138% of the federal poverty level. The income limit for children age one to 18 is slightly different. That category will still be eligible for Medicaid up to 154% of the federal poverty level. And the amount range from $0 to $19,836. Now there is adults age 19 and 20 living with parents. The first one is not living with parents. 19 to 20 not living with parents maximum income would be 17,775. Living with parents will still be eligible for Medicaid up to the amount of $19,964. And that is at 155% of the federal poverty level. Now for pregnant women and infants under the age of one, individuals who are also eligible for family planning benefit would be eligible for Medicaid up till a maximum amount of $28,723. That is at a 223% of the federal poverty level. Um, this can be a bit confusing to a lot of people. So I'm looking forward to answering any of the questions you might have on the income, size of the family, age, at the end of the presentation. And now we're going to look at Medicaid as it relates to a third party health insurance coverage. We call that TPHI. Now there are two major third party health insurance coverage that we'll be looking into. These are not the only third party health insurance coverage available, but the most common ones is um, the employer-sponsored insurance, which we call the ESI, and there is also Medicare. If you are enrolled under your employer's coverage, you can still apply through the marketplace to see if you would qualify for Medicaid in addition to your employer's coverage. If you go through the, let's look at the chart again. Now, looking at the, at the chart, if you are just a single person enrolled with your employer's coverage and your income is below $17,775, I would encourage you to still apply through the marketplace to see if you qualify for Medicaid. Now, if you are determined eligible for Medicaid through the marketplace, the coverage will not be like that of someone that does not have 
another coverage like an employer's coverage in that you would not be able to pick a plan under the Medicaid eligibility. It would be a regular Medicaid coverage. And the purpose of that coverage is to ensure that you, uh, you have access to services that you qualified for under Medicaid, but your employer's coverage will not cover. I've seen that some employer's coverage do not cover dental services. Some employer's coverage might also not cover your family planning um, services. You qualify for those services under Medicaid. So if you qualify for Medicaid in addition to your employer's coverage, you can present your Medicaid information to the provider to access dental services and family planning services. In addition, when you have Medicaid in addition to your employer's coverage, you would be able to apply and enroll in what we call the Health Insurance Premium Payments Program, HIPP. The Health Insurance Premium Payment Program would assist you with paying part or all of the premium you are paying under your employer's coverage if you qualify for it. So, when you are enrolled in the HIPP, due to the fact that you qualify for Medicaid, the states think it is more affordable to assist you with paying the premium under your employer's coverage than give you the entire Medicaid coverage. So you'll still be covered by your employer, but Medicaid will be assisting you with paying the premium under your employer's coverage if you are enrolled in the HIPP. Now, some people that also have Medicare may also qualify for Medicaid based on income and family size. Ordinarily, when you qualify for any part of the Medicare program, whether part A part, or part B, you would not be eligible to have, apply for Medicaid through the market list unless you are a parent or caretaker of a child under the age of 18. So if you are a parent or caretaker of a child under the age of 18 and you are enrolled in Medicare Part A or Part B or both, you can still apply through the marketplace to see if you qualify for Medicaid in addition to your Medicare coverage. Under that, we have the Medicare Savings Program, MSP, whereby Medicaid will be reimbursing whatever Medicare is deducting from your social security benefit. If you are not a parent or caretaker of a child under the age of 18, you can still apply for Medicaid, but that would be through your local department of social services or your HRA if you live in the city. Um, for a household of one person that has Medicare and want to apply for Medicaid, we usually, the New York State of Health usually offer what we, what we call the Access New York form. This is um, a form you can use to apply for Medicaid through your LDSS if you have Medicare and you, it's just you in your household. That form can be mailed out to you, we can also email it, we can mail it physically to your address. We can also email it to you through your email address. You complete the form and submit it to your LDSS or HRA for Medicaid eligibility determination. Okay, and then we come to Medicaid and pregnancy and newborns. So, some people might have what we call presumptive Medicaid eligibility. This is a temporary coverage pending approval of or completion of the actual Medicaid application. There are some designated hospitals and other outfits where you can go to apply for the presumptive Medicaid eligibility. This is made available to ensure that people in dear need are able to access medical services immediately without having to complete the entire actual Medicaid application. Um, the application can be, can be submitted by a doctor or medical provider in a medical facility. 
it would only give you temporary coverage so that the provider can attend to you at that time. It would only cover outpatient services. So if you are under the temporary coverage and you fail to complete the actual Medicaid application, if you incur bills that has to do with services that are classified as inpatient hospital services, you would be responsible for the bill. Medicaid will not cover it under the presumptive eligibility. So if you have presumptive eligibility, you have a limited time to contact the marketplace via one of the three ways I've explained to complete the actual Medicaid um, application to get the full eligibility. Now, when you report pregnancy on your New York State of Health application, it might change your eligibility to Medicaid. Because like I said, under the income um, criteria, a pregnant woman will still be eligible for Medicaid up to the total of $28,723. Well, that would not even be for a pregnant woman because on the application, the pregnancy is counted as a household member. So a pregnant woman would fall under the category of household of two. That is the mother and the unborn baby. So you'll find that if you are the only one on your application previously and you qualify for the advanced premium tax credit, and then you come in and tell us, oh, now I'm pregnant. Once you report pregnancy, your advanced premium tax credit eligibility might change to Medicaid because you will still qualify for Medicaid as a pregnant woman up to the income amount of $38,347, which should have been um, income eligibility for advanced premium tax credits for a woman that is not pregnant. When you become pregnant, this income will still qualify you for Medicaid. Now, the, the system recognized that some people might not want to change their doctor and the hospital they've been attending or the provider will not accept Medicaid. Um, when this happened and your eligibility changed from maybe essential plan or advanced premium tax credit to Medicaid, based on the fact that you reported that you are pregnant, there is an option for you to request to still maintain your previous eligibility. In order to achieve that, you will be required to submit a ticket. And the reason for the ticket will be stated as, consumer is pregnant, but would like to maintain APTC or essential plan coverage. Processing of the ticket takes appro approximately seven to 10 business days. And usually, that gives you back your APTC or essential plan coverage, despite you reporting your pregnancy and um, it just take away the Medicaid eligibility. And then after delivery, a pregnant woman would still be eligible for Medicaid up to 60 days after delivery. That is called the postpartum coverage. So after delivering, your Medicaid eligibility will not be cut off immediately. You will still be covered by Medicaid for the next 60 days. Now, when you have your newborn, it is required that you come back on your application and provide your newborn information in order to get the, the newborn covered. When you are pregnant and report your pregnancy, there would be an unborn Medicaid ID card issued to your baby. It will come with the name unborn since we do not have the um, baby's information yet, the name, date of birth and all that. So you will receive a Medicaid unborn ID card. So we need you to report information of the baby when the baby is born so we can change that card from unborn to one that would have the baby's name. You have 60 days from the date of birth of that baby to report the child's information on your application. And that would ensure that the child's coverage would start from the beginning of the month of birth. So if you had your baby like um, say the 25th of January, 
you are required to report the birth of that baby on or before the less on or before 60 days from the 25th of January. I don't want to use the 25th of March because we might have more than 60 days in between. They count the actual days. So 60 days before, I mean, after the 25th of January, the birth of that child must be reported so that the child would have Medicaid with the managed care plan started from 1st of January. If you report the child's birth or information on your application after the, six, after the 60 days criteria, then the child's enrollment would go by what is called the 15th of the month rule. The child would not have his ease or Medicaid coverage started from the month of birth. The coverage would follow what is called the 15th of the month rule in that if you report between the 1st and the 15th of a particular month, coverage will start the next month. If you report after the 15th of a current month, coverage will not start until the subsequent month. So I encourage us, if you have a new baby, do the newborn a favor, add the child's information to your application within 60 days of birth. And that would also help you to cover medical bills associated with the birth of the baby as the coverage will start from the beginning of the month of birth. And now we're going to what is called the Medicaid and um, Medicaid managed care plans. Everyone determined eligible for Medicaid must pick a plan. The available plans in your county would be populated on your application after your eligibility determination. It is required that you pick a plan and in picking a plan, what is most important is to ensure that the plan you are selecting would be acceptable to the doctor you are currently seeing. So I usually advise my consumers to check with their doctors and um, find out which of the available plans will be accepted to them before they go ahead to select one. Some people would not need to select a Medicaid managed care plan they fall in the exception to the general rule. And these are people that have third party health insurance like I've mentioned earlier. And um, people that, that have third party health insurance coverage and people that have emergency Medicaid coverage. We're going to talk about the emergency Medicaid coverage on the next slide. If one is determined eligible for emergency Medicaid coverage only, there won't be option for plan selection. And sometimes when the system is waiting for you to submit document to confirm your Medicaid eligibility, you might be given just regular Medicaid until that requirement is satisfied. So generally you must pick a plan. And the plan I'm talking about is offered by insurance companies like Fidelis, Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVPL plan, and so on. Plan selection under Medicaid goes by what is called the 15th of the month rule. Like I mentioned earlier, if you are picking a plan between the first and the 15th of a month, the plan would be effective the next month. If you pick a plan after the 15th of a current month, the plan will be effective the beginning of the subsequent month. Plan selected between January 1 and January 15 will start February 1. Plan selected between January 16 up to February 15 will not start until March 1. Okay, now um, Medicaid itself is classified as a full coverage. And Medicaid on its own start from the beginning of the month of the application. So if you apply for Medicaid today being the 1st of December, that's not a good um, example. Let's say you apply like the 10th of December, you would have your Medicaid start from December 1. But the plan selected on the 10th of December will not start until January 1. So that means you would have 
only regular Medicaid for the whole of December. And your MVP Fidelis or Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, that is the plan you have selected, would be added to your Medicaid coverage from February 1. When that is the situation, we must be careful about providers we go to for services. When you know that you have the regular Medicaid coverage, always verify that the, the provider you are seeing in the month of your regular Medicaid coverage is willing to accept regular Medicaid for payments. Otherwise, if you go to a provider that will not accept regular Medicaid for that month, then there will be no way for the bill to be covered because the provider won't allow payment from Medicaid. They want you to have Fidelis or Excellus. So make sure the provider you are seeing accepts regular Medicaid for the month of um, fee-for-service coverage. Now we have some exceptions to that. The first one is, if you are not a new enrollee on the Medicaid, a new enrollee is someone that does not have any Medicaid managed care plan coverage in the last 90 days. So if you are not in that category, you have Medicaid managed care plan at the time you are selecting this new plan or within 90 days of losing your previous Medicaid managed care plan, we can, the marketplace can submit a ticket to request for your Medicaid managed care plan to start from the beginning of the month of your coverage. For instance, we have people that are migrating from the LDSS Medicaid into the marketplace. They have coverage with the LDSS before they are being transferred. And because they have Medicaid coverage with the LDSS when they are transferred, if they run the application, since Medicaid start from the beginning of the month of, um, of the application, they would not be determined eligible because the system will be seen that they are already covered for that month. So they would have to wait for the LDSS coverage to end before they can rerun the um, New York State of Health application for eligibility. So you will see that at that time, their Medicaid um, managed care plan with the LDSS has ended. Now they are applying with the marketplace and they are getting fee for service from the beginning of the month of the application. Based on the fact that they apply through the marketplace within 90 days of losing their LDSS coverage, they would be eligible to submit a ticket to have their MMC started from the beginning of the month of that application with the marketplace. I know it's, it's a bit um, complicated, but I will try my best to answer your questions and expatiate more on that when we come to the questions um, and answer section. Um, another criteria has been opened under the COVID criteria. So now during COVID, um, there is possibility for you to request an earlier start date for your Medicaid managed care plan. And this is how that works. If you apply for Medicaid in November, let's say you apply November 20 and you pick a plan, going by the 15th of the month will have explained earlier, the plan selected will not be starting until January 1. Since we are not yet in December, the COVID criteria allow you to file a complaint, like an appeal actually. It allows you to file an appeal with the marketplace for the start date of December 1 instead of January 1. Once you have an appeal in the system, that will generate the necessary criteria for a ticket to be submitted to have your Medicaid managed care plan started from December 1 instead of January 1. But if we are already in December, if the plan selection was completed in um, like December 10, you would have it started from January 1. 
And since we are already in December, that option will not work because it is um, put in place for you to be able to request the start date of a, uh, a future earlier start date. So in November, December will be a future earlier start date for someone that pick a plan on the 20th of November. But by the 10th of December, there is no um, future start date than January that you already have. So the next one would be for people um, selecting plan after the 15th of December to have the start date of February 1, then they can request for the start date of January 1 instead of February 1. Again, complicated. I'm willing to expatiate more if we still do not understand. And um, like I've been mentioning, we have the fee for service Medicaid. That is what we call regular Medicaid. Most people would have that um, in the first month of their application if they are new and released to Medicaid. Some might have it for one month, some have it for two months, depending on the time of your application. So it will be one month if you apply between the first and 15th of a month, you would have um, fee for service for the month of the application, your plan starts the next month. It will be two months if you applied after the 15th of a month, you would have regular Medicaid from the beginning of the month of your application and the next month, and then your managed care plan will start the subsequent month, okay? And this is what I'm talking about when I mentioned um, emergency Medicaid. Now, once you are in the United States, many people do not understand that the system would give them emergency Medicaid coverage for the fact that they are lawfully in the United States. So even if you are just a visitor, you do not have um, um, the type of um, coverage that people that goes to the US CIS would have, you can still apply through the marketplace and see if you would qualify for emergency Medicaid pending your stay in the US. The emergency Medicaid will not allow you to pick a plan. That is, there will be no MMC. You would only have the fee for service Medicaid and it will only cover you in emergency cases only. For instance, if we have someone just slum in, in, a, um, in a mall and an ambulance had to be called to take that person to the hospital, that obviously is an emergency situation. And there, there is this coverage in place. The hospital can also run the application or refer the, um, the person to an application counselor or if they have an application counselor in the hospital, they can quickly run the Medicaid um, application to give this person emergency Medicaid coverage for treatment of that emergency um, situation. When you apply by yourself, the system will still consider your income, the size of your family and your immigration status. Despite the fact that um, it is embedded in the system that you would qualify for emergency Medicaid based on your temporary immigration status, I've still seen some people that are not determined eligible for any coverage. The system just says you are not eligible for coverage. When I look further, I see that it might be that their income is above the limit for Medicaid. If they have income above the limit for Medicaid, then they do not qualify for the other services since they can only be eligible for emergency Medicaid based on their immigration status. So if you have people working under the table, people that refuse to perfect their immigration status, apply for Medicaid, they are making um, income, but their immigration status does not qualify them for um, emergency Medicaid coverage, they can have other, other um, eligibility like essential plan or advanced premium tax credit based on their immigration status and their income is above the limit for Medicaid, then they won't be eligible for any coverage. And then we come to the duration and benefits under Medicaid. 
Medicaid would give you 12 months of continuous coverage irrespective of changes reported. When we say irrespective of changes reported, we are saying that if your income changes from when you were first determined eligible for Medicaid, you are encouraged to still report it, but it will not take away your original Medicaid coverage. Let's assume that you applied for coverage in January and at that time, your income was just $10,000. Come May, you realize that um, you're now making more money. Maybe you changed your job or you got a raise or got a new um, position at work that gives you more money. And you report that, oh, now I'm making $34,000 that will still not cancel your Medicaid coverage. The system will tell you, though you are no longer eligible for Medicaid, but will continue your coverage because certain individuals determined eligible for coverage get that coverage for 12 continuous months irrespective of changes reported. So don't be afraid to report increase in your income when you have Medicaid. It should not cancel your coverage. If it does, then you have the right to request for a ticket to be submitted for the continuation of your Medicaid coverage for the 12th calendar month from the first time you are determined eligible. Also, if you are eligible for Medicaid and a member of your household left, reducing the size of your family from two to one, you still have to report this person is no longer a member of my household that will still not take away your Medicaid coverage. Your Medicaid will still run the 12 calendar months of coverage. Benefits of Medicaid. It's a $0 monthly premium. When you are eligible for Medicaid, you are not required to pay any premium. It is zero. There is no deductible. Deductible is the amount you will pay out of your pocket before services become subsidized. Under Medicaid, you do not have a deductible. However, you have co-pays for services, especially during the time that you have the regular Medicaid coverage, the fee for service. And the maximum amount you will pay out of pocket in a year for Medicaid coverage is $200. Now on my next slide, I have the co-pay charts for Medicaid. And you can see here that clinic visits would cost you $3 per visit. And that is outpatient clinic in hospital or freestanding clinic such as community health center. There will be no co-payment for clinic visits regarding the following services. Mental health clinic, family planning or prenatal services, alcohol or drug abuse, methadone clinic, tuberculosis directly observed therapy, developmental disability, and mental retardation clinics. Those would have zero copay. You don't have to pay anything for those services. But if it is a general regular clinic service, your copay will be $3. Then for your prescription, generic drug is $1. Preferred brand is $1. Brand name prescription will be $3. And that is one co-payment charge for each new prescription or order or refill. Whenever you refill your prescription, you'll pay the, the co-payment, generic $1, preferred brand $1, brand name $3. There will be no copay for drugs to treat mental illness, birth control, family planning, and tuberculosis. For over-the-counter medications, you pay 50 cents. Lab tests will be 50 cents per test. So you will see that um, your copay will be, you pay different copay for different test, uh, lab tests, blood work, another test, urine test, and five, five cents per test. Then for x-ray, it is $1. There will be no copay for lab tests for pregnancy and prenatal test. There is also no copay for x-ray in private doctor's or dentist office and for x-rays in emergencies. 
Then for medical supplies, your copay generally is $1. And by uh, medical supplies, we mean syringes, bandages, gloves, um, sterile irrigation solution, incontinent pad like diapers, eating pad, and so on. There will be no copays for birth control supplies, condoms, diaphragms, and um, contraceptive creams. Those would have no copay. For overnight hospital stay, your copay will be $25 upon discharge. Whether you are admitted for one day, for 10 days, for a month, for three months, whenever you are discharged on one hospitalization, your copay upon discharge will be $25. There will be no copay for hospital stays for childbirth, miscarriage, family planning services, parental care, or an emergency condition. Now, for emergency room, your copay would be $3 for non emergency or non urgent services. But if it is a pure emergency, and how you know that is defined by the provider. If the provider classified the services rendered to you as an emergency or urgent, then there will be no copay. If it is decided that, well, this person came to the emergency room, but services provided is not classified emergency or urgent, your copay will be $3. Private doctors or dental, dentist or hospital, there is no copay for that. So these are co-pays for regular Medicaid. When your Medicaid managed care plan kicks in, the only copay you'll be left with would be for your prescription. $1 for generic, $3 for brand name. But before your Medicaid managed care plan kicks in, you are responsible for all the co-pays as stated. Now, canceling your Medicaid coverage. Your Medicaid coverage will be canceled if you move out of state. It is required that when you are moving out of New York State, you contact your application counselor or the marketplace, or if you have your application online, go online and report your out of state address, the address of where you're moving to. Once you report a non New York State address, that would automatically cancel your Medicaid coverage. Not doing that might prevent you from enrolling in coverage in the other state you are moving to, because all these systems are interwoven. If another state is still seeing you as covered by New York State, they might require that you go back to New York State to cancel your coverage in order for them to give you that state's coverage. So whenever you see that you are moving out of New York State, um, before you move, when you are sure of your move date or just after moving, call the marketplace, give us your out of state address so we can update your application for cancellation. Also, if you have undeliverable address on your account, it might also terminate your Medicaid coverage this is put in place for your own security. If we send you a notice and the postal services return this, the notice as undeliverable because you are no longer located in that address or any other reason why the um, notice cannot be delivered to you at that address, the system would automatically terminate your Medicaid coverage to make sure that your coverage information does not fall into wrong ends. If the system requires that you submit a document to perfect your eligibility determination for Medicaid, and you fail to submit the required doc document within the required time space, that might also terminate your coverage. But at this time, due to COVID-19, request for document submission, if it has to do with income, is being waived. So if you complete your application and the system says you need to submit income document to perfect the eligibility or your eligibility is pending the submission of that document, just give a few days for the system to automatically delete that request. It will be waived. You are not required to submit your income document 
at this COVID time, it might change when the wave is over. So at this time, income documentation is being waived for Medicaid eligibility. But if you have to submit like your immigration verification document and other documents apart from income, you would want to make sure that to submit that document within the specified date to avoid cancellation of your coverage if you already have it. Then you can also cancel your Medicaid coverage by changing your application from financial to non-financial application. The New York State of Health have different types of application. The financial application is the one where you would be required to submit your income and other information to see what you qualify for. Under the non-financial application, income information is not required. So if you change your application from financial to non-financial, and this can be done by the response you give to a question on the application asking if you need help with the cost of your health coverage. If you say yes, you are creating a financial application. If you say no, then you are creating a non-financial application. So if you have Medicaid, it is definite that that um, answer is, I mean, that question is answered as yes. If you go back and say no to that question, that changes you to the non-financial application and that terminates your benefit under the financial application and your Medicaid coverage would be ended. There is also another point on the application where the system asks if you need coverage. It will be yes when you are determined eligible for Medicaid. When you go back and say, no, I do not need coverage on this application any longer, that would also end your Medicaid coverage. And that is amongst other reasons why your coverage could be ended. Um, and so we come to the end of this presentation. Um, if you need any assistance with your application or you're struggling with any information on your application, please contact the Legal Assistance of Western New York. The intake line is the 855-250-7748. My direct line is 585-504-2660. And my other navigator colleague can also be reached at 716-373-4701, extension 2015. Um, for other Law New York services, because this is not just the services um, legal assistance of um, Western New York offer, for other services, the intake line is 585-325-2520. My, and the website is www.lawnewyork, that is L-A-W-N-Y dot O-R-G. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Vishy. If anyone has any questions and just wants to put it in the chat, please feel free. If not, we can wrap this up. Okay. Thank you for everyone for attending. And we hope to see you on our next series. Have a good day.